So from an AI perspective, is they become these trivial ideas of mapping a smile to being happy, and these kind of trivial ideas become real to us <coughs> through Hollywood, through cultural spreading of information, and we start to believe this, and therefore it becomes real. In, a, in, in, in as much as anything is real about our, cult, our perception together. So it's really important scientifically, the ideas that you're presenting, but does that mean there's just because our brain doesn't feel those explicit emotions, does that mean they're not real? I didn't say we don't feel explicit emotions. So I want to be really clear about this because it's an interesting, this, you know, this, um, this inference, it's an interesting inference that people often make. And so, but it's, it's a mistake. Um, and it's a mistake that betrays a certain kind of thinking that we do in this culture. And it's, it's the mistake of the following sort. So when I say there's no um, facial expression that is diagnostic of a single emotion, that doesn't mean that um, people don't express emotion. They certainly do express emotion. They just don't, you know, when, when they're in a state of anger, or in a state of sadness, or in a state of awe, their faces don't do one thing. When I say, well, your body can do many things when you're angry, uh, or when you're sad, or but let's take anger. Your heart rate can go up, it can go down, it can stay the same. Your breathing rate can go up, it can go down, it can stay the same. The same pattern that you see in anger, you sometimes see in sadness, and you sometimes see in fear. You sometimes even see it in enthusiasm and in awe. So does that mean that emotions aren't real? No, emotions are real, but, but sometimes things are real because the physical meaning of the signal is endowed in the signal, okay? Mm -hmm. So when your retina communicates to your brain that you, have, that you are, are faced with a wavelength of that you know, is 600, you know, 600 nanometers, the signal is endowed in your brain. That's like in the signal. It's not like interpret, you don't interpret that it's 600 you know, nanometers. It is 600 nanometers. The information's in the signal. But when you see red, that information is not in the signal. Your brain has added information that isn't in the signal itself. In a sense, your brain has imposed meaning on a signal that the signal doesn't have on its own. So let me back up and give a different example to make it a little easier, and then we'll reapproach this. There's a, there are some things that we in fact, this is true almost of all civilization, right? That we, there are some things that are real by virtue of the fact that we agree that they exist. Little pieces of paper serve as money, or now, you know, Bitcoin, or little pieces of plastic, or gold, or diamonds, or in the past, barley, salt, shells, rocks, serve as currency, have value, only because a group of people agree that they have value. So we impose meaning on objects, and once we all agree that that object actually has value, we can trade it for material goods. The minute that some of us disagree, that uh, we, we withdraw our uh, consent, right, the things lose their value. That's what happened in the mortgage crisis. That's what happened in the tulip crisis in the, in, you know, the Netherlands uh, in the 17th century or 16th century, or whatever it was. Money, currency exists because we impose meaning on objects in the world, physical objects in the world, that themselves don't have that meaning on their own. And they are very real. Money is very real to people. I can stick somebody's head in a brain scanner and show you that they experience value in a very real way. But that, that reality is constructed by um, the fact that they have learned the value right. in a particular culture. Well, that's also what we do with emotion. We impose meaning on certain physical signals that they don't have by, on their own. And, but we have collective intentionality. We all agree 
that scowling is sometimes uh, uh, anger. And so it becomes anger in a very real way, just like little pieces of paper become money. So it sounds like you kind of think about the expression of emotions as a kind of language, as an extension of a language that we we'll learn, in the same way that we collectively agree on a language, on a lexicon, and a, how we use that language. Sure, you could think of it that way. I mean, everything, everything in our culture is, almost everything in our culture is a function of social reality in this way. Right. Um, we are citizens of uh, a country because we all agree that the country exists, more or less. And um, wow, you guys barely even laughed at that. OK. <laughs> um, what's a revolution? A revolution is when some people in the country withdraw their consent. They no longer agree. Right? A president has powers in a country because we all agree that a president has powers. The president only has powers by virtue of the fact that we all agree that he or she has powers. If we stop agreeing, the president doesn't have those powers anymore. It's very real. People's lives depend, outcomes of real people depend on these um, social realities that we build and nurture. And we wire these social realities into the brains of our children as we socialize them. And when people move from one culture to another, they have to learn the new uh, social reality that they are faced with. And if they don't, they get very sick physically because our ability to agree um, on what something means actually is important for regulating our nervous systems. So can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, for machine learning methods, for systems that learn to behave based on a certain reward, it's important to kind of uh, have some ground truth and, and learn. Uh, so how do, it sounds like, the expression of emotion is learned. Can you talk about how we learn to fit into our culture by expressing emotion with our uh, face, body, given the context, given the rich? Uh, what's that process look like? When does it happen? Uh, how much sure, is it Sure. Well, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, I wrote a 400-page book, so I'll try to do it in like a couple sentences. Sure. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, so how, does a ch how does an infant learn anything? So an infant's born, and it can't really do anything for itself. It can't regulate its own nervous system. It can't keep its body systems balanced. This is a term, scientific term for this is allostasis. Allostasis is your brain's ability to predict what your body's going to need before it needs it and tries to meet those needs before they arise. So an example would be, if you're going to stand up, if your brain's going to stand you up, it has to raise your blood pressure before it stands you up. If it doesn't, you'll fall. That's costly from a metabolic standpoint. It's costly. You'll hurt yourself. So an infant's brain can't do this very well. An infant doesn't know when to go to sleep and when to wake up. An infant doesn't, can't feed itself, can't regulate its own temperature. It, someone else has to do it. And when someone does it, the infant is learning. The infant is learning. It's taking in sights and sounds and smells um, and the physical sensations from the body, which are comfortable and pleasant when the infant allostasis is maintained. So right from the get-go, an infant is learning statistical learning, um, you know, the capturing um, events, including their consequence for the infant's body. Some people think babies are born, you know, attached already to their caregivers, but they're not actually. Infants don't even know what a caregiver is. It's just that the caregiver is there constantly meeting that infant's needs. That's how infants start to learn. Now, if there are statistical regularities, like, for example, an infant is not born with the ability to recognize a face as a face, but it learns that in like the first couple of days of life. Why? Because human faces have some statistical regularities to them, right? Two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, kind of in the same place most of the time. So it learns really quickly. But here's the interesting thing. Around three months of age, Infants start to learn what we call 
abstract categories. They start to learn that some things which don't look the same or sound the same or smell the same um, actually have the same function. And how do they learn this? They learn it with words. So if you do an experiment with a three-month-old, three months old, okay, and you say to that baby very, very intentionally, look, sweetie, this is a wug. And you put the wug down, and it makes a, a noise, like a beep. And then you say, I'm like, I don't have props. And then you say. <laughs> I have my wallet. <laughs> yeah, OK. And then you say, give me your wallet. Yeah, okay, give me your right. wallet. <laughs> and then you say, look, sweetie, this is a wug. And you put the wug down, and it makes a beep. If you say, look, sweetie, this is a wug, that infant expects that object to beep. Why is that important? Because in the real experiments, this might be yellow and squishy and um, tall. And this might be red and pointy and you know, hard. And this might be, you know, so lots of different um, uh, perceptual features. But, um, but the infant knows, uh, learns that the word is inviting the infant to understand that the function of those very different physical signals are actually the same. Similarly, you can take you know, six objects that are exactly identical in their physical features, how they sound, how they smell, what they feel like, um, what they look like, and you can name three of them with one word and three of them with the other word, and the infant will understand that um, these are actually different objects. That happens a little after, you know, not, not as early as three months. But the point is that we, we talk all the time. We use words all the time. What do we do with infants? We're constantly pointing things out and labeling them. This is a dog. This is a cat. You're angry. This person's sad. Oh, mommy's really happy today. Oh, you know, mommy loves you. Oh, daddy's really excited about this, and so on and so forth. And infants, um, learn really, really quickly. Words are considered to be kind of invitations to form abstract concepts. That is the basis of almost all of the, um, uh, you know, mental um, categories that we, uh, that, that we, mental events that we experience. We're basically teaching children um, to form these abstract categories. Not, and that's the basis of money and it's the basis of um, roles that we have with each other and what we expect from each other. It's the basis of a lot of the sort of functional categories that we use in everyday life. We impose meaning on sensory, on sensory arrays that those sensory arrays in and of themselves don't necessarily have. They only have that meaning because you and I both learn that that package of sensory array means something. So when I make that, you can anticipate what will happen next. Just because we've learned those, um, are, they're wired into our brains you know, in our culture. And when we go to a different culture, we have to learn sometimes different packages. Yeah, different mapping. So you're saying that there's a few sources of sensory data and uh, a few building blocks inside us, the feelings of some kind that we learn to then from an early, that we were come born with those? Or <clears throat> Part of no? what your brain is doing is it's trying to make sense of the sensory array around it. So from your brain's, pers so from your brain's perspective, just think about it from your brain's perspective. Your brain's perspective, it spends its entire life trapped in a dark, silent box. And it has to make sense of what's going on around in, in, in the world so that it knows what to do to keep itself alive, right, and well. But it has to, it has to know what to do based on, it has to know what, what's happening all around it only from the effects that it receives through the sensory um, systems of the body. So a flash of light, what's a flash of light? It could be anything. Um, what, you know, what's a like, a, like a siren, a siren could be, you know, a fire truck, or it could be 
um, somebody's car alarm went off, or it could be a doorbell, or it could be, right, any particular sensory cue could have multiple causes. So your brain's trapped basically in your skull, and all it gets are the effects, the sensory effects of stuff that happens in the world. But it has to figure out what those things are so that it knows what to do. So how does it do that? Well, it has something else that it can draw on. It has your past experiences. Your brain basically is, doesn't store experiences from the past. It can reconstitute them in its wiring. And that's what it uses to guess at what those sensory cues mean, what those sensory changes mean. So in one situation, a siren means one thing. In another situation, it means another. A flash of light means one thing in one situation and a different thing in another. So your brain is using past experience to make guesses about what these sensory changes mean so that it knows what to do. And it, it has the same relationship to the sensory changes in your body. What's an ache in your stomach? Well, it could be hunger. It could be anger. It could be disgust. It could be longing. It could be nausea. It's not that there's one um, ache in your stomach for nausea and another ache in your stomach for hunger. There are many aches in your stomach, many different feelings of achiness uh, for nausea, and many different feelings of achiness for hunger, and sometimes they overlap. So your brain has to make the same kinds of guesses about what's going on in your body as it does about what the sensory events mean in the world. And that's really what it's doing. It's, it's guessing and making sense of the sensory array so that it knows what to do next. And when it guesses wrong, it takes in that, the, you know, the, the sort of... Um, the information that it didn't predict well, um, which, you know, in psychology we have a really fancy name for that. We call it learning. Your brain takes in the information that it didn't predict um, so that it can predict better the next time, to make sense of things the next time. So you kind of uh, answered this a little bit. I'd like to elaborate on it. If you were to build a robot that performs maybe passes the Turing test or performs at the low bar level of, instead of myself here today, it would be a robot talking to you, it would be convincing as a human. How would you, what kind of, uh, how would you build that system in a sense, um, in paralleling the infants? What essential aspect of the infant experience do you think is important? It needs, well, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I'm not a computer scientist, right. so. Uh, but so the way that I would say it is it needs to have a body. It needs to have something like physical systems or an analogy to physical systems. It has to do something analogous to allostasis. So what, what sorry to elaborate, so what would be the goal um, for the system? You kind of mentioned previously that the goal would be to, for the brain to just stabilize itself. No, it's not that the brain is stabilizing itself. You know, so people talk about reward. What is reward? In machine learning, it's pretty easy. It, it's it's something. <laughs> it's 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 mathematical. So it's it, there's no philosophy to it. it you just oh, you, there's philosophy to everything, right? Whether you admit it or not is a different story. But, right. Yeah. So uh, you wanted to uh, play a game of chess, play a game of go. You wanted to pick up a water bottle. There's a okay. You, but what is reward? Existence. Dopamine is actually not reward. Dopamine is effort. Dopamine is necessary for effort. It's not necessary for reward. I mean, it's commonly, if you read the most, co most up-to-date literature, that is what you'll see. That it's actually, people can, animals can find things rewarding, um, can be without, um, without dopamine, actually. But they, uh, they, they need dopamine to move. They need dopamine to encode, to, to, to learn information. So it's really for effort that is required to um, work towards getting a reward, I would say. And um, uh, when, the, when a brain, an animal brain, a human, you know, any kind of animal brain, mispredicts what the reward will be, that's when you see a real surge of dopamine um, because it, the animal has to adjust its um, action. But, but reward is basically... Um, bringing the body back into allostasis. It feels good when that happens. 
And people will, and animals will work tremendously hard to, to have that happen. So, you know, what is motivation? Motivation is, is expending resources to get a reward. So, basically, if, if you don't have something like physical systems that have to be kept in balance, water, I mean, for humans, or for actually any living creature on this planet, um, even, you know, single-cell organisms, actually, there's an analogy to what we're talking about here, uh, to, to brains. But, you know, salt, water, glucose, all these systems have to be kept in balance, and they have to be kept in balance in a very, very efficient uh, way. Um, and that's the motivating, so-called motivating force, really. That's what, that's, what, that's what really brains are for. So, and that is the basis, the consequence of that regulation it are the basis of, you know, affective feelings, which are for many, many creatures on this planet, a property of consciousness. Okay. So maybe uh, if it's okay, we'll take some questions from the audience. Sure. But first, let me ask the last question. Is, so on building on the robot question, how would you uh, build the same kind of robot that you would be able to, as a human being, fall in love with? Well, you know, people fall in love with their cars. <laughs> they fall in love with... Um, they fall in love with their blankets. They fall in love with their toys. You know, you don't need, it doesn't need much to fall in love with something. The question is, will it love you back? No, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would elaborate, I, I think. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah, I think you're answering that love in the way we're defining it loosely in poetry and culture is, uh, is a social construct and it's relative. What I mean is uh, sort of the idea of monogamous long-term love that we have deep connection with other human beings that we have. You're saying you could do the same with a car, like a nice 69 Mustang. Are you Toyota. telling me that you, you, you're telling me that you've never, you don't know anyone who is like so in love with their car that you, okay. Now That's here's true. the thing. I, so yeah. one, so here's the thing. We, um, we are social animals, okay? What does that mean? What does it mean to be a social animal? It means that we regulate each other's nervous systems. So our brain, my brain isn't just regulating my nervous system right now, it's regulating yours. And actually, it's regulating other, other people's in the audience too, and vice versa. And why is that? You know, I mean, other animals do it too. We're just like, really good at it. Um, but other animals, like there are some insects that are social species. They regulate each other's nervous systems. They do it with chemicals. They do it with smell, primarily, and a little bit with touch. Like earwigs will, you know, like they can actually, I have this great picture of this like totally disgusting looking little bug, but it's like, you know, cuddling its little baby, ugly, little ugly baby bug, too. Um, it's an adorable <laughs> picture. Um, but, you know, what about mammals, like rats? Well, they also use chemicals, like smell, but they also use touch. And um, to some extent, um, they also use sound. They use hearing. Primates add vision. And as primates, we, do all, we use all of those senses to regulate each other. And we also use something else. Words, right, exactly. And words, the systems in our brains that allow us to speak and allow us to understand words are directly connected to the parts of the, the brainstem that control the body. I don't mean like there are a bunch of, I mean, mono, I mean monosynaptically connected. So exactly the same systems in your brain that are important for you to be able to understand language and to speak are also directly, directly affecting the systems of your body. And that is why I can say something to somebody, I can speak to you and I can have an impact on the nervous systems of people all the way at the back of this auditorium without they, you know, maybe they can see me, maybe they can't. Maybe they can, hopefully they can't smell me. Maybe they can hear me, maybe they, you know. But they can, if they hear me speak words, I can affect their nervous systems. That's why a telephone works. That's why a telephone works to where you can feel connected to someone just merely by hearing their voice. Um, 
because the sound of their voice has an effect on your nervous system. It can, it can make you breathe faster, it can make you breathe slower. And the words also have an effect because when I say a word like, mm, I don't know, um, when I say a word like car, that's a short form. I have a bunch of mental features in my mind when I say the word car. And I say that word, and that invokes those similar mental features, maybe not identical, but similar enough that they invokes it in your mind. And your mind is made by your brain. So it invokes, if I just say the word car, there are changes in your motor system that would be exactly the same or very close as if you were actually in a car, right? So this is um, something that we do. And the fact where attachment comes from, an infant to a caregiver or, um, a, or two lovers or um, two really close friends, comes from the ability that we have to regulate each other's nervous systems. And that is why um, when you don't have that kind of attachment, uh, you die sooner. On average, seven years sooner, loneliness kills. I always tell my daughter, my daughter's 19 years old, and I always tell her, you know, breaking up, when you break up with someone, it feels like it will kill you, but it won't. Loneliness, however, will kill you. <laughs> it will kill you, on average, seven years earlier than it would if you didn't have uh, an attachment. And that's because our nervous systems, you know, as our bodies got really complex through evolution and our brains got bigger, they could only get so big. There are constraints on how big any brain can get that have to do with, you know, birthing the infant, but it also has to do with the metabolic cost of a brain. Your brain is really expensive. My brain, really expensive. Three pounds, 20% of your metabolic budget. That's a lot. And so what did evolution do to solve this problem? Well, it couldn't make our brains any bigger, so it just entrained other brains to help manage our nervous systems. So you bear the burden of other people's allostasis, and they bear your, the burden of yours. Not always at the same time, but that's what it means to give people support. When someone, when you're feeling horrible and somebody pats you on the back or says nice words to you or gives you a hug, they are physically having an effect on your body. That they are helping your body to maintain allostasis at a time when your brain probably couldn't manage it on its own. And so the basis of love or attachment is, is basically that. It's the ability to affect each other's nervous systems in a positive way. I always say to people, you know, the best thing for a nervous system, a human nervous system, is another human. And the worst thing for a human nervous system is another human. <laughs> because we're social animals. Well, wow, beautifully put. So uh, maybe a, a few questions from the audience. Do you mind? There's, a, there's microphones on both sides. Go ahead. Sure. Hi, thanks for talking here. You're saying cool stuff. Thanks. Not a question. It's okay. <laughs> I'll take it. It's all right. <laughs> so I was thinking about what you were saying about reward, and I'm wondering, first of all, is you described it as a return to allostasis. Is reward in any way linked to the... Um, I just like the reinforcement of pathways or behavior so that the next time you get that stimulus, you will, you'll respond in the same way. And I'm also wondering about uh, the link between the desire for allostasis and the need for novelty and the need to like, explore yeah, it's a great our question. environment. It's a, great, it's a really great question. So um, uh, the second question is so much more interesting than the first, actually. So let me say this, that, um, that uh, there is a need for novelty. The need differs by, for different people, I will say. Novelty, um, so first of all, uh, 
the we can think about the need for novelty in a really um, proximal way, or we can think about it in a really distal way. Like, uh, but basically, when I say that a brain is organized or, or engineered for um, metabolic efficiency, that doesn't mean that the goal is to to only ever have your prediction, you know, your brain's predicting all the time, to always have its predictions completely perfect so you never learn nothing because you'll be bored out of your mind, right? And also, you know, humans like to expand their niche. They like to explore. So it's a constant balance between what um, biologists would call exploitation and exploration. Novelty is, is um, it's exciting. It, there's actually an increase in norepinephrine, an increase in arousal. It feels really exciting. Um, but it's also super costly. Novelty requires usually that you um, learn something new. That means that's actually a really metabolically expensive thing to do. Um, and it also means usually that you're moving your body around, which is also a metabolically expensive thing to do. So the need for novelty is balanced by its cost. And um, different nervous systems can bear different amounts of cost. So for example, if you take two rats um, uh, that are um, somewhat genetically, you know, mod like they've been genetically bred, one is bred, when you stick it in a, um, a novel cage, it just sits still. And the other one, when you put it in a novel cage, it like roams all over the place. And it's just, you know, it's going crazy, kind of exploring everything. Well, the one that sits still, scientists might say, oh, that's a nervous rat, or that rat's afraid. What is that rat doing? The rat is not moving, and it's not encoding anything, because enc encoding something is expense it's expensive. Um, this rat, on the other hand, is roaming all over the place, moving a lot, learning a lot, so it's encoding a lot, spend, 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 save, 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 spend, spend, spend. There are, time, there are differences between people, and there are also differences between times in your life, where moments where you feel like you have a little bit to spend, and other moments where you feel like you really have to conserve. When I talk to the public, I always talk about, I don't use the word allostasis, it's just too boring a word. But I sort of do is sort of explain it like a budget. You know, like your brain is sort of like the financial office of a company. A company has lots of offices. It has to balance the expenditures and revenues. And it's got to keep everything in balance. So it might take a little money here, move it all over to that office. You know, it's got to keep everything in balance. What it's always trying to do is spend a little bit to make a little bit more. Um, but what happens when it spends a little bit and it doesn't get a revenue back? There's no reward. What happens? Well, it goes into the red a little bit. So what do you do when something goes into the red? Well, you might do something risky. You might actually spend a lot to try to really make, you know, not just make back your deficit, but actually make a lot. That would be novelty. That would be move and spend, move and, and encode. Or you might reduce your spending. You might say, well, I'm going to save a little bit now. That would be I'm not going to move too much. I'm not going to spend too much. I'm not going to encode anything. So I certainly don't mean to suggest to you that, um, that novelty is unimportant or that learning is unimportant. Um, and it's a really important question about um, what is there any intrinsic value to um, uh, novelty over and above uh, the rewards that it would give you in an allostatic sense. But, it is really clear to me that the extent to which you, um, any nervous system will embrace novelty and even seek it pretty much depends on the allostatic state of that, of that system. If you don't have a lot to spend and you're already in the red, you, if you, at a certain point, if you continue to spend when you're in the red, you go bankrupt. What that means in human terms is you get depressed. It means that your, your brain makes you fatigued so you can't move, and it makes you, um, locks you in so you stop paying attention to anything going on around you in the world, and your experience is just what's in your head. That, that's actually what depression is. So that makes me think of allostasis more of as a range than as a zero point. It's, a, that... it's not homeostasis, it's okay. allostasis. It's a range, for sure. But we, we, I'll let, answer some other questions, and maybe I'll get back to your first question uh, if there's time. Yeah. 
So if I understand your argument correctly, if we're going to make anything like a general intelligence, something approaching, you know, like a, like a, a human, um, it needs to be an embodied system. Well, I, I want to be careful about saying that because for two reasons. One, because in biology, there is this concept of degeneracy, which is a sucky word, but it's a great concept. And it means that there's more than one way to skin a cat, basically. You want a functional outcome? There are many ways to get to that functional outcome. Mm. So genes, for example, you know, there are a lot of characteristics that are heritable, but we don't know the genes for them. And the reason why is that there isn't one set of genes. There are like multiple sets of genes that can give you actually the same outcome. So what I want to say is that you need something akin to a body. It doesn't actually have to be a body. I imagine there are lots of ways that you could implement a system, you could implement an agent that has multiple systems of some sort that it has to manage. But my point is that one thing about that is very important that we continually miss, when we think about building an agent with mental states, we continually miss the fact that it has a body. It has a, humans have bodies and that's the brain's primary task. And our most fundamental feelings come from the physical changes in our body, even though we don't normally experience it that way. That actually is how it is. If you just look at the wiring of the brain, you just see it. So it seems to me that if you want to build an agent that is human-like, it has to have something like a body. It doesn't have to maybe be a body. And I'm sure there are many clever ways that you could implement something like a body without it actually being a body, if you, know, if you understand what I mean. So Amazon Alexa could be there if we just gave it some sort of, I don't know, representation of mental states or some kind of allostatic yeah. target. Sure. Here's the, let me just say one other thing because I think it's really important. All a brain requires is that you at some point had a body. You don't, right? So, Basically, I mean, this is what phantom limb pain is. This is what um, um, chronic pain is. This is what happens. You know, if at some point you cease to get information from your body anymore, your brain still can simulate, still can reinstate the sensory patterns that once came from the body. And that's what's required. Right? At some point, the body isn't really needed anymore. Yeah. I think we're here, yeah. Um, so um, emotions in humans look as though they're implemented by a bunch of hacks. So there's a bunch of chemicals that go into your brain. Um, there's um, oxytocin, serotonin, um, a whole bunch of um, biochemical things that diffuse around in the fluids in your brain that affect your emotional state. And that seems like a hack that we've inherited f over millions of years from primitive ancestors. Um, and if you look at the machine learning world, we can do a bunch of similar things with neural nets. So you can increase the activation thresholds on a large scale, um, yeah, change the amount of noise going into the system. You can do a bunch of similar things, but you don't have to rely on um, fluids being um, kind of cleaned slowly by glial cells. Um, things don't diffuse around in the fluids um, in the system necessarily. It seems like there's a lot more flexibility. Um, so, so when you come to implementation, there's not meant so many constraints um, imposed by the evolutionary history on the whole system. And it seems like that would make it work better. So when people are in negative emotional states, um, they can't think straight. Um, if you fall in oh, love. Oh, that's absolutely not true. People can think actually quite well in um, negative emotional states, I have okay, to tell so, you. So, um, but the emotions, they can plan crimes, do, they can do very nefarious things very, right. very effectively. Right, so, but the general point I think um, is true, even if that example is not. So, um, um, emotions kind of flood your um, nervous system with... No, emotions um, don't flood your nervous system. Uh, um, Sorry. So, some of them do. Yeah. So, no, power, powerful really, love. Yeah. So. So here's the thing. Let's talk about. Let's talk about. In your bloodstream. Let's talk about. Let's talk about those chemicals. Let's <laughs> talk about those chemicals. There is not a single chemical in your brain or anywhere in your nervous system that is for emotion. Um, Serotonin is not for emotion. Dopamine is not for emotion. So Oxytocin is not for emotion. Even opioid. You know. Even even opi even opioids are not for emotion. So they influence your emotions. They're involved in. They emotions. influence every mental event that you have not just emotion. Um, so sure, your so brain, for yeah. example, your brain is a physical, it's a set of physical cells that are bathed in neurochemical systems. 
And the neurochemical systems that you're referring to basically change the ease with which information is passed back and forth between those neurons. That's always true. It's true regardless of whether the event is a motion or whether it's a perception or whether it's a thought or whether it's a belief. It's always true. So for example, serotonin, serotonin is a neurotransmitter that allows your brain to delay gratification of a reward. It allows you to expend energy now because you anticipate a reward at some point in the future. And if you have a deficit in serotonin, then you can't do that very well. And it turns out for humans, one of our great superpowers is the ability to uh, do mental time travel, to remember in the past and also to do things now because we know they're going to have an effect 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 years from now. So the, the, I, you know, in, when I said you have to have something like a body, I'm not saying literally you have to have a physical corporeal body. I'm saying you have to have, I mean, it's just a fact. It's not an argument. It's a fact that your brain, that brains evolved for the purposes of regulating multiple systems. Um, and from a cybernetic standpoint, you know, um, the best way to regulate a system is to build an internal model of it. That's what your brain is. Your brain is an internal model of your body in the world. It's running simulations. It's running this model. And if you want to have an agent that is somewhat human-like, that has feelings like humans, then they have to do something, the, the, they have to have to be able to do something similar. And whether it's a actual physical corporeal body or not, I think is you know, that's an open question, right? So it sounds a bit as though you're disputing my premises before I've got to my question. So I started off by saying... Probably, sorry. <laughs> I started off by saying um, emotions are implemented as a bunch of hacks. So would you say that, that was broadly correct, or would you say that um, they're not hacks, they're finely tuned and adaptive and... Um, well, I wouldn't say they're not maladaptive, but would you say it's a bunch of hacks? I don't think they're... I don't know what you mean by hacks. Uh, I think... So cl kludges, um, kind of historical accidents that I got think it's the wrong, you're talking about emotions like they're, they're talking, the, you, the premise of your question, I can't answer your question because I think it's not the correct question. I mean, it's, emotions aren't like um, blood pressure, you know, they don't exist in that sense. They are, um, they are the way that they are, first of all, not all cultures have, not all people in all cultures have emotions. Everybody has affect, assuming they have a neurotypical brain of sorts, but, um, but they don't all have emotion. And so to answer your, the question that you're answer, asking me is, I can't answer it because I don't think it's the right, I don't think it's the right, right question. So opioids and the, um, the pain systems um, seem like um, things that influence your emotions fairly directly. So this, it's not that it's the same thing, but it's that there's a powerful link. Opioids, though, so opioids are important for instances of emotion, but they are also important for every other category of mental event that your so brain affect, can make. They affect a lot of other things too, I agree. Um, so I, I, you know, but you will see sometimes scientists will assign, you know, a, an emotional meaning to something, like dopamine is for, you know, first hedonic pleasantness, and then it's for reward. People like to assign single functions to um, biological uh, entities like a chemical or a brain region, a cl cluster of neurons, or it's just not, that's really, I'm not saying every chemical does everything, but whatever, op whatever opioids do, they do in every waking moment of your life, not just in moments sure. uh, w that are emotional for sure. you. Um, I should stop now. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it was very interesting that you brought up the last topic of love because I think it actually brings up a really important thing, which is, and what you were saying about connection. Um, that's, I mean, the primary purpose of life is to procreate, right? I mean, that, that's what our genes do. So, well, first of all, right? I'm not even touching that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so, that, and, and it's, of course, in humans, it's not just genetic, it's mimetic. I mean, we, we procreate our ideas as well as, you know, physically. And 
so a primary purpose of our wanting our our reactions and interactions with other people and other things is that goal is that we get rewarded when we interact with other things in a way that creates something new, whether it's art or you know a book or technology or something like that. And if we don't put that, if there's no inherent reason for a robot or a computer system to want to do that, I mean, how do, how could we, can we even imagine putting that into a system? inherently that it wants to, that it just desperately wants to make something new. I mean. Well, here's what I would say. You know, when we're, we're when, first of all, we're not, we talk about, um, we've been focusing a lot on bodies. I'm certainly not saying that's a sufficient condition, right? I'm just saying it's a necessary one or something like a body. But I certainly have the uh, motivation to create, and I'm, I'm imagining that you do too. I have to tell you, not everybody has that. Most adolescents don't have that. Many adolescents don't have that. Okay, that was a joke. I have a teenage daughter. I'm just telling you. Um, yeah, but the point is that um, that what people um, what people find rewarding is is remarkably diverse. But um, the property I think is that there has to be a feature of reward. Um, for, for a lot of people, that's, cre you know, that's having an impact in some way. Um, having an impact on another person, having an impact um, you know, on a, um, building something that wasn't there before, whatever, you know, in, in, um, innovating or um, discovering. But it's not true for everybody. It's just true for like, a lot of people uh, in this room, probably. And certainly the people that we probably spend a lot of time with, but not, not for everybody. Well, and then there's also the genetic part. Sure. I mean, look, but if you want to, you know, if you want to, um, if you, you know, we can certainly make a, a genetic argument here. Absolutely. There, um, there, um, the, there's nothing that I've said today that is inconsistent with the idea um, that, um, that you have to, that you have to pass your genes on to the next generation and actually make sure that that generation survives to reproductive age. It's not just enough to have uh, offspring. You have to make sure the offspring survive to, to reproductive age. And um, there's a whole argument about, um, you know, uh, the, the learning of um, social reality, concepts of social reality that we've been talking about, like money and emotions and so on. Um, that makes that argument, right? That it's very expensive to have to encode everything in genes uh, or to have to uh, learn everything from scratch every generation. So instead what we have is a system, a genetic system that allows us to wire the brains of the young uh, with what we know. And that's what we do, basically. All right, so it's the, the I'm curious about your uh, analogy about intentionality that you talked about when you use the analogy between money and the perception of red to the, facts that we, the fact that we have emotion. Because the distinguishing feature, it seems to me, is the level of intentionality. And as you said before, our brain assigns meaning to things. But we don't, or maybe, and, and my question is whether or not you agree with this, I guess. We don't always deliberately assign meaning no, to it. It's, this is nothing I've said is about ever deliberate. But sometimes we do. Sometimes we Quite do. often, actually. Yeah. So when you go back to like the question of what makes something intelligent, a lot of previous talks have been about, you know, we want to pick a goal and then we create costs to achieve that goal. But that goal is deliberately assigned. So when you talk about like what makes something intelligent, what do you think the role of intentionality is and the spectrum therein? So first of all, when you talk about intentionality, I think you have to really be careful that you are, philosophers talk about intentionality in two ways. Okay. They talk about intentionality to mean a deliberate action, the mm. way you mean it, but intentionality mm. can also mean that something has a referent out in the real world, out, mm. out, outside of mm. you, really. So that a word, a word has a, a referent, that's the, um, you know, the intention of the, of the word, basically. Mm. 
And so I think you have to be really careful. Okay. I also think that you have to make a distinction between a conscious, deliberate, um, explicitly, a, a goal that you can explicitly describe and um, uh, I mean, you're, you're sort of making, you're sort of making, I mean, what, the kind of question you're asking is getting very close to the question of free will, which I would love to not have to discuss. <laughs> but, um, but basically, okay. and, and I'm, what I'm about to say is going to sound very Cartesian, unfortunately, because that's English. I don't know, uh -huh. there's no other way to do it, actually. But what I want to say is that your brain is always, there's always um, volition but it's not always consciously experienced by you as, as agency or will. Uh -huh. So yeah. you're not, a, you're not a, a sea urchin, you know? Your sensory neurons are not hardwired to your motor neurons. You have interneurons. That means you have choice. Do you consciously experience yourself as making choices all the time? No, you don't, but uh -huh. your brain is actually making yeah. choices all the time. That's why people who study decision making you know, think they're studying the whole brain, because they, they are, actually. Um, so I think you have to be really careful about, there are words that we use in English and in science that have two meanings. Mm -hmm. They can have a meaning that is about decision making or choice that is just obligatory, automatic, and a function of how the system works. And then there's the kind of choice that feels deliberate and effortful and where we feel like we're the agents. We experience ourselves as the agents. Um, and intentionality um, usually can be assigned to the second one, but actually in truth, in philosophical terms, it can also be assigned to the first. That yes. when you, even if you're completely unaware of having made a choice, you're acting on something with some degree of volition because you, you, it's not a reflex. It's not that's like right. you know somebody hit your patella or tendon and you kick. And so, so that's really interesting. The, so you know, I think you just have to you have to make that distinction. Yeah. And I probably should get to well, the next sure. question. We can Last follow. Last question. Yeah. I'll, Thank I'll, you. I'll, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you've been asked a lot of esoteric questions about AI, but I, I think we might gain some insights uh, by wondering about DI, that is, uh, dog intelligence. Oh sure. Um, so. I believe I, I sort of understand what my dog is feeling, and I, I, I usually believe that um, my dog, you know, believes the same, um, but not the same with, you know, a cat. Um, well, that's because you're not a cat person. Right, right, okay. Yeah, yeah right. sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't know that much about monkeys, um, but I've never really seen a monkey be able to make the expressions that, a, let's say, a dog can. <laughs> Um, and I was wondering if you had any insights about, you know, why dogs are able to do this and, and why we're able to read dogs. Is it something just simple, like they're, they have the right facial muscles, or is it something, some drive that allows them to learn this? So I think before I wrote my book, I would have answered this question differently. Um, but now here's what I would say. I think, um, what, you know, many creatures on this planet ha have affect. Right. right. Um, and we can debate about whether, you know, I just came across a paper the other day about whether fly, you know, does dr dr Drosophila have, a have affect? And, you know, it's, I mean, it's actually a really interesting question. They certainly, they have something like opioids and they, you know, um, so it's, it's an interesting question. But dogs, dogs are really interesting because they do seem to have some capacities that only, that you only see in, in great apes, and they may have capacities that great apes, even other than us, don't have. And I mean, so they certainly have some capacities we don't have either. But, but here's my point. We actually bred them. We bred these animals. We selected them, basically. It's not natural selection. It's, it's you know, artificial selection. And we selected them for a couple of things, right? If you look at the experiments on breeding, taking a fox, you know, taking foxes and breeding them into what look like little dog-like animals, it's interesting what they can do. And one of the things they can do is they can move their facial muscles in, 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 in a lot of ways that uh, they have a lot more control over their facial muscles than, you know, chimpanzees and, uh, do um, and, and other apes. Um, and they also do, um, they do joint attention really well with gaze. 
So this is something that really no other animal can do, I think, other than a dog other and humans. And that is they can, they, um, they meet your gaze and they use gaze for reference. So, you know, they'll look at something and they'll look back at you and you, you know, that's actually partly, that's how we communicate with each other. Chimpanzees lose that ability after about 10 or 11 months of, of age, but, but dogs continually do it. And actually joint attention, shared gaze, is how we communicate with our infants also. That's actually partly how we teach infants about what's important in the world is with gaze. 